And so, um, the Hutus, because of this particular genocide, ran away, went into exile in neighboring Tanzania, which is very close to Burundi. And that had consequences. And I'll return to that later. Um, <clears throat> We should know that Rwanda and Burundi are one country. They are both occupied and inhabited by the same people, Tutsi and Hutu in Rwanda, Hutu and Tutsi in Burundi. So they are the same people. And of course, it's part of the colonial project that divided them. So, you know, the two people go back and forth. Now, when in 1972, this massacre became so um, appalling that um, it changed the political landscape. The Hutus took control of everything related to the state. They completely dominated the state. And the Hutus were in fear of their, their life, excuse me. And nobody, nobody of Hutu um, descent could challenge the authority of the state. Now, when Hutuness became a crime, kind of, the refugees who exiled themselves in Tanzania did not remain inactive or silent. They also, on most occasions, plotted along ethnic lines and always wanted to come back and attack the Tutsi-led government. In Rwanda, the same, the same history happened there. The Germans were there for a while. The Belgians took over and did the same thing, privileged the Tutsis over the Hutus. And the Tutsis dominated state government, the army, the civil service, and all parastatals. And so, when the genocide occurred in Rwanda, in Burundi, the Rwandese, or Rwandans, were accused of having rendered a helping hand to the Tutsis in Burundi. And so, the Hutus in, Burundi, in Rwanda also had that in mind, that the Tutsis had planned this whole idea of dominating the two countries the two countries. The Hutus were excluded, both in Rwanda and in Burundi, from any senior position. Opportunities for education were suppressed for the Hutus. Um, political, um, political opportunities were also crushed. And so it, it became impossible for the Hutus to access education, which will better privilege them to participate in state governance. In, in 1993, from 1972, 1990, 1988, there was another mini genocide in Burundi where the, Tuts, the Hutus again came from their hiding camp in Tanzania, tried to overthrow the state government of, Tutsi, of the, the state government led by the Tutsis. They did not succeed. A good number of them, some people have put the estimate at um, um, 100,000 to 150,000 of them were killed. But then Burundi fastly 
escalated, the, the situation escalated into a civil war. The Hutus who remained in the country did not stop fighting for their rights. The Tutsi-led government did not stop suppressing the Hutus. And so it became so serious that um, both parties knew nobody was going to win this civil war. And so in 1993, again, I'm glossing over a long um, history here. But in 1993, to come fast, quickly to our present um, um, situation, in 1993, it was agreed that elections should be held. And whosoever won the election should respect the privileges or should extend privileges to the losing faction. And so if the president called Buyoya was um, um, elected. And then he introduced, Buyoya was a Tutsi. He introduced a lot of reforms. He, liberal, he tried to liberalize the political atmosphere by appointing Tuts, Hutus and Tutsis in equal number to government positions. But then there were some Hutu hardliners who did not believe in such political liberalization. And so we are undermining him. In fact, he appointed a Hutu as prime minister, although he was very savvy in the sense that uh, he made sure that in as much as he gave prominent positions to the Tutsis, to the Hutus, sorry, I keep, <laughs> I keep um, um, confusing the two. In as much as he gave prominent positions to the Hutus, he ensured that the Ministry of Defense, or like the Secretary, Secretary of Defense, remained in Tutsi's ha Tutsi hand. He ensured that the Justice Ministry remain in the hands of Hutus. But anyway, um, he, he was undermined. People criticized him, and people told him that um, uh, the, re the reforms were not effective, and they did not go far enough. And so in protest to that, he called elections, again in 1993. And a, a Hutu this time around, by the name of Milkoi Indande, I don't want to bore you with the names, um, won the elections. But 100 days after he won the elections, the Hutu guy, who defeated the Tutsi guy, the Hutu guy tried to be as liberal as he can. Um, I'll give you some statistics. He appointed about 20% of the cabinet to Tutsis, about 40% to Hutus because they had the majority. And then the third one, Gawan, he gave them about 10 to 15%. In any case, he enacted reforms because he wanted the civil war to end. But unfortunately, 100 days after he took over, he was assassinated. And then the Tutsi led army, of course, led the coup in his assassination, and they took over again, um, which triggered another civil war. So most of the refugees who were in Tanzania hardly came back when this incident occurred. And they continued plotting from their base in Tanzania, and some had already moved to another place called Democratic Republic of Congo. I don't know whether some of you have ever heard about the Congo the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I like to call it DR Congo uh, because one of my students gave me the best joke and fun about DR Congo. When I was teaching about D Democratic Republic of Congo, I would always write DR Congo. And so this student was making a presentation in class. And he said, so my topic today is going to talk about Eastern Africa. And I'm going to specifically focus on one particular country. The country is called Dr. Congo. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, what do you mean? He said, that's it, DR Congo, Dr. Congo. I said, oh, no, DR means Democratic Republic of Congo. <laughs> so I stopped, I stopped calling it DR Congo. <laughs> but anyway, so a good number of Hutu refugees were in Democratic Republic of Congo and in Tanzania where they planned their trip. So they came back. They came back and attacked the Tutsi-led 
military government that had killed, for the first time, their own president. And so they said, you know what? This place is going to be ungovernable. And so they started fighting again. And uh, President Ndande, in, in who initially started all these reforms, who is Tutsi, and who, uh, who accepted defeat in the hands of Milikori, came again and then kicked, it's very confusing, but kicked the Tutsi-led government out of power. So yet, so there was a civilian government, but still a Tutsi-led government was already in power. The Hutus said they are not going to accept that. So between 1993 and 1996, there was civil war in, in Burundi. It was free for all. Everybody was trying to get a, a piece of the cake. And then um, within that short period, you had several presidents. Presidents came and went. And then the Organization of African Unity, which is now called the African, Unity, African Union, came in, got involved, tried to redress the, the, the problems and tried to initiate peace and so on and so forth. It became very, very difficult. There was acute, acute, acute violence. Violence really prevailed. So um, the United States, the European Union, South Africa, and to some extent, um, Japan and these countries put a lot of pressure on, the, on President uh, Buyoya to say that um, you have to give peace a chance. And I remember, I think I was in Africa then, I remember when the then president of, U of uh, Tanzania, um, Julius Nyerere, was shuttling back and forth, back and forth, trying to establish peace. And so in 2000, they finally agreed to a peace accord called the Arusha, um, uh, Arusha Peace and Recon Reconciliation Agreement. They agreed to this accord, and the solution that was devised to minimize the continuous civil war, which as I said is overpower, was such that they said, okay, now let's agree to this. Let's have two vice presidents, one being Hutu, the other being Tutsi. Let's have 60% Hutu in government positions, because they are in the majority. And let's have 40% Tutsi in um, civil service positions. And let's do the same for parliament. Let's allow 60% um, of the MPs, members of Congress, for example, Hutus, and 40% Tutsis. Um, and it was agreed in that accord that um, no one single ethnic group should have 65% of the positions of government. That they should, they should avoid that. And that pub public enterprises should have 60% Hutu, 40% um, Tutsi in past status or um, um, governmental organizations. In, 19, in 2005, so that, 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 that accord held for a while. I mean, even though there was occasional attacks here and there, the accord held for a while. And so there was, there was some strange peace in Rwanda, strange peace in the sense that, um, as I have already mentioned, Rwanda has always been, Burundi has always been characterized by war. So within 2000 up to 2004, there was some, there was some peace. And in 2005, Peter Nkwanziza, who was also a Hutu, won the elections again. And even though the Tutsi opponent contested the election, well, yeah, contested the results and so on and so forth, he largely agreed to the elections. And so the Hutu guy remained in power.